Hey guys, what's growing? It's Heather at Bush Poppy Farm. Today I'm going to present to you my top five favorite spring flowers to grow. So welcome to my Bush Poppy Farm YouTube channel. Uh, if you guys are new here, and there's a lot of you, <laughs> Welcome. I'm really happy you're here. And if you've been around for a long time, I'm also happy you're here. Thank you for joining me today. Um, for those of you who are new, I'm Heather Morano. I am a cut flower grower and um, gardener in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area. I grow in zone 9B and I sell my flowers through a CSA through wedding work and as well as on-farm events and workshops and uh, hopefully this year through a wholesaler. I also have been gardening for well over 20 years and this year I'm expanding my gardening to grow more food for my family which I'm really excited about. <clears throat> Excuse me, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> so thank you for joining me here today. Um, we are in between pretty crazy storms. I'm sure you've been seeing in the news that California is going through multiple atmospheric rivers, which is not unprecedented for us, even though you may hear that. Uh, it's just that climate change is making things a little more aggressive than they usually would be. Um, so we've been getting a lot more water uh, a lot faster, but we are still in a drought and so we need this water. So I'm grateful, uh, but I do feel terribly for the people around here who are suffering from flooding, who have lost their businesses, etc. I mean, it is a big deal. Uh, today we had lots of thunder and lightning, which is very rare for here <laughs> because of the way we have a cold ocean right next to us. Um, thunderstorm production doesn't usually happen. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of bizarre to hear that. Even though I grew up in Florida, I was very used to thunderstorms there. It was kind of crazy to hear them here. All that being said, uh, let's get started on the top five spring flowers that I love to grow and that you can grow too. Number one is ranunculus, also known as buttercup. There are over 600 species of ranunculus and um, there are native varieties uh, that actually just exist, you know, out in nature. Um, a lot of them are still in Italy. And in fact, that's where some of the ranunculus um, producers are, is in Italy. Uh, the name, um, the Latin name, actually means little frog, which I find super cute. <laughs> uh, the indigenous Americans used to call them coyote eyes. There was a story that coyote was uh, playing with his eyeballs, tossing them into the sky. And then a crow came along and ate those eyeballs. And so Coyote picked some buttercups, ranunculus, to take the place of his eyes. <laughs> so I find that a really fascinating story. Um, I love ranunculus for their multiple petals. It has between 100 and 130 petals on each flower. They're just packed. Um, they remind me somewhat of peonies in that way, where it, they start out as a as a little ball and then they open and open and open and open and open and open for a long time until you get to the center. So they're a really cool flower. Um, they're not hard to grow either. So they symbolize eternal love and attraction. And um, as a cut flower, they last for a really long time, which is another reason I love growing them. Uh, seven to eight days is their base life. If you take good care of them, change out water and give them some food. They last for a long time. They also have medicinal properties. The petals um, were used topically as uh, relieving joint pain and aches. Um, and then the roots were used for skin, skin, skin conditions like warts and stuff. However, these were used topically and they are poisonous. So you can't eat them. <laughs> Don't eat them. Um, also, Anything that I list uh, medicinally or whatever in these top fives, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an herbalist. Um, this is just information that I've gleaned. And so don't hold me to this. If you want to use any of these things uh, medicinally, do your own research. All right. Um, 
They also make a good dried flower, apparently. I have never tried this. I'm gonna try that this year because I'm growing a lot of them. Um, they won't wilt. Um, once they dry, they'll stay nice and stiff, but the flower colors will fade a little bit over time. But I think that's okay because there are other dried flowers that hold their color really strongly. And um, I think because a lot of the colors in Ranunculus are, are kind of pastel shades to begin with, I think fading a little bit would be, would be fine. Probably give you this nice antique look. Um, let's see, they grow from corms and I'm gonna link to a video below here of how I um, pre-sprout them and how I start them in trays. And so you'll get to see what the corms look like. They look like little octopuses. Um, and so you can learn more about that in the video linked below. You can multiply your stock of ranunculus through the corms because just like with bulbs, uh, when you plant a single corm over the course of that season, it will multiply and produce more corms off of that, which you can then tease apart and you have multiple plants. Um, so that's how you can multiply your stock. I fall plant um, all of my ranunculus because I am in zone 9B. Um, they bloom for me, so I fall plant them around October, and then they start blooming for me um, in late March and they go through late April, early May for me. Um, they do need full sun and well-draining soil, and you'll need to, um, you can treat them as perennials and put them in your garden, give them some space so that they can multiply. Um, and, but if you're gonna treat them as an annual, like we do for cut flower production, you need to wait till the tops die back to brown before you harvest those corms and dry them out to then use next year. They're hardy down to about 23 degrees Fahrenheit, negative five Celsius, uh, but they do benefit from frost cloth when temperatures are in the 20s. Um, so that's their cold range, hot range. They actually will go dormant and stop producing when temperatures reach um, around 80 degrees Fahrenheit, around 26 degrees Celsius. So keep that in mind. If, uh, in fact, this year we had a, a hot snap uh, in like April. Um, and it got up close to 80 degrees and I was worried that all my production was gonna stop because we hit those warm temperatures. Thankfully, using frost cloth to cover them and keep them a little bit shaded during that time helped them continue to produce. So that is another way you can use frost cloth with ranunculus. Um, if you do plant them as perennials in your garden, keep in mind that every two years or so, you're gonna need to dig them up and divide them or the clump will get so big that they'll just stop producing. And then, in order to get the most blooms out of your corms, make sure you pinch them when the seed that when the new growth is about six inches tall. And I'll actually be doing that soon, so I'll show you what that's all about. Number two, narcissus, also known as daffodils. These belong to the amaryllis family, um, which also includes, you know, flowering amaryllis, but then other species like agapanthus and the allium um, species as well. They are native to Southern Europe and North Africa, and they grow from bulbs. So you guys have seen these. You have tulip bulbs, you have narcissus or daffodil bulbs um, that are pretty popular in uh, fall to plant for spring blooms. Um, they are perennial in zones three through nine, so they have a really broad range. Um, you potentially could get away with zone 10, but you'd have to keep them uh, cold in the winter time. Um, I have heard stories of people growing them and putting ice um, on them in the winter time on top of the soil to give them those colder temperatures uh, in zones 10 and up. Um, there are over 13,000 different varieties of Narcissus. I personally love to grow the frilly decorative ones. Um, I don't, I have a few of just the regular yellow daffodils that everybody's used to, but for the most part, everything I grow is a fancy heirloom variety. Uh, presented as a bunch, a whole collection of them, they are considered um, they mean happiness, you're spreading happiness, but a single daffodil given to someone supposedly means um, that misfortune is on the way. So next time you give somebody daffodils, make sure you give them a whole bunch and not a single <laughs> bloom. Uh, they can bloom for up to 50 years if they are in a spot that has the right conditions. So they're a very long lived plant. Um, you can totally perennialize these in your garden if you are in zones three through nine. Um, 
Make sure, again, when you plant them that you give them lots of space because they will multiply over time. And, and then also over time, probably every three years or so, you're going to need to dig up some of those bulbs, separate them out so that, to give them more room to spread and plant the uh, bulbs elsewhere. Um, they release latex from their stems, which basically kills anything else in the vase uh, until that stem heals over. So the way I use them in um, arrangements is I cut the daffodil stem, I put it in its own vase of water for a few hours until that stem heals over and stops leaking latex. Um, you'll see the water will get all milky from the latex. Then you can put it in uh, water, water with other flowers and it won't be a problem. That latex is what leads to them being deer and rodent and everything proof. Nothing will eat these things. They're, they're toxic. So it's great if you're like me and you have a big deer and squirrel population that likes to um, nibble on your garden. <laughs> so I have these planted along my front walk um, and the squirrels don't dig them up. The, the deer don't eat them. So that's a really it's a really great option. Also, there's so many varieties, so you could kind of never run out of, of um, you know, variations on how you can have your landscape look. So if you are going to perennialize them, plant them deeply. And like I said, give them space so that they can multiply. Um, they thrive in full sun uh, to partial partial sun. I even have some that are in partial shade um, and I'm testing them out this year to see how well they'll do. Um, just like I mentioned before with ranunculus, the same thing happens with uh, daffodils. Once the bloom is gone, either you've cut it or it has died off on the plant, the leaves will start to turn brown. This is important. Those leaves feed the bulb through photosynthesis, develop the sugars and everything that that bulb needs to produce a flower next year. So please do not cut off the leaves until they are brown and dried. And also don't, uh, a lot of people you'll see would like bunch up the leaves and tie them up. Don't do that either because that restricts the amount of photosynthesis that can take place and you're not giving the bulb all of the uh, nutrients that it needs through the sun in order to produce you a great flower next year. If you're worried about them looking messy, which a lot of people are, put them in a place where you have larger plants that will come up, either come up or have already exist around them that will cover up that foliage as it's dying back. Number three, snapdragons. Snapdragons are new to me. Um, last year was my first year growing them. And I was completely surprised and very happy with the results. Uh, the Latin name, Antirrhinum, means calf snout. And if you look at a snapdragon uh, flower, you can kind of see where that comes from. They're super cute. Uh, the flowers are edible and they are often used as garnishes in, um, in restaurants sometimes, so you could do that as well. They come in a whole variety of colors, which I really love. And uh, they do need full sun and moist soil. So if they get too dried out, they just will stop producing. Um, I get two to three flushes of blooms from each of my snapdragon plants. So the first, the first flush is a couple of very, you know, three to five very strong stems. Um, I take those and then more stems will come up. The preceding, the, the following bloom, uh, flushes of blooms, the second and third, um, are thinner stems. And, uh, but they still are fine. They still work great. Um, and towards the end of the season, I tend to get a lot of rust. They are prone, prone to rust, but I didn't notice, first of all, the rust didn't affect the flowers at all. And if you're a cut flower grower, you're stripping all the greenery anyway, so it didn't matter. Um, but then, you know, that was towards the end of the season anyway, so it wasn't a really big deal to me. Um, they should be pinched just like ranunculus. Um, any multiple blooming flower, cut and come again, in other words, um, should be pinched. That will give you multiple stems. Single blooming flowers like stock, um, single bloom sunflowers, <laughs> they should not be pinched or you'll have no blooms. So make sure you know the difference on those. Um, there are, there, these guys are hardy in zones seven through 11. So can't take super cold temperatures, but fairly cold. And if you grow them in a greenhouse, you can go down to zone six in the winter time. So there are four groupings of snapdragons. The first one is the winter group. And these, these require 
uh, kind of lower light, shorter days. Um, they generally are only grown in greenhouses because it's during the winter time. Um, these are for zones seven or six, um, and they are shorter varieties with smaller flower heads. So not so many of these for cut flower production because we generally need the longer stems. Um, there are, so some of the series in, in group one are the Admiral series, the Alaska series, and the Chantilly series. Then you have group two, which is early spring. These guys need a brighter light and longer days than the winter ones, but not as bright and, uh, of light and as long a days as the summer series, which is uh, the summer group, which is group three. Um, so they are a little bit taller with a little bit um, bigger flower than the winter ones. And the some of the series in group two are Cinderella, Costa, and Little Darling. And then you have uh, group three. I think I said before group three was summer, but that's group four. Group three is late fall. So you can, uh, it, that would be tough for me because we kind of don't have a fall so much. We go from kind of from like hot weather in October <laughs> into and September into winter. So these won't really work for me, but in other in other uh, zones they could. The late fall are similar to group two in terms of sunlight needs and length of day. Um, there are a couple series there, animation and Apollo series. But the one that most people grow is group four and these are the summer ones. These need the most light, the longest day, hours, and they have tall stems with big flowers. So um, uh, the Rocket and the Opus series are the most common ones um, here. So if you want a, a long period of um, Snapdragons, then grab some from each group and then you'll have a very long period of production. Mine generally come on in mid-April and for me they bloomed, like I said, into July um, and August, even though those later months they had rust, but they were super, super productive. So I really love them. Looking forward to doing them again this year. Number four are snowdrops. Now these little guys are tiny little bulbs that kind of look like little onions. Um, and they are usually some of the first flowers to appear in the spring, along with my number five, uh, which is hellebores. Uh, they are symbolic of spring and purity, and they feature prominently in a lot of Christian uh, mythology and iconography and stuff. They are hardy to zones three through seven, uh, but the leucogem variety can go up to zone eight. Even though I'm in 9B, I still can get really nice production of snowdrops, mostly because of where I put them in my garden. So I have them planted in a, a, a space that gets morning sun, but um, afternoon shade. And so the soil stays a little cooler and I think that's why they like it there. Uh, they spread for me and they're, yeah, so they should be coming up soon actually. I'm hoping they're already starting to uh, come up. Um, they contain something called galantamine. This is a substance that has been used to treat Alzheimer's disease. So that's Pretty fascinating. There are more than 2,500 varieties and they vary in height from seven centimeters to 30 centimeters. So um, I really like the super tall ones. I think they're so cool to look at. They grow in full sun or part shade. Uh, they're great to put around trees. Um, they can grow in containers, but you cannot let that container dry out, especially in the summertime or the bulbs will just die and you won't get a re resurgence of blooms. Plant them in drifts, just like with other bulbs. They look best uh, when they're in drifts as opposed to one here, one there, one here, one there. They will spread and naturalize in zones three through seven, sometimes eight. Um, however, I'm getting some naturalization in zone 9B. So just depends on where you put them in your garden. Um, propagate them by lifting them, dividing them. And so this is like in the spring, right after flowering, they still have green tops, lift a clump, break it apart into multiple clumps, replant those clumps uh, directly into the garden right then. And even though the greens will topple over and they'll kind of look sad, it'll be fine. Leave the greens on just like with your other bulbs. Let the sun help replenish those bulbs through photosynthesis and then they will come back for you next spring, spread even more through your garden. And number five, my final 
favorite spring flower are hellebores. These I'm also fairly new to. Just in the past four years or so, I started putting them in my garden. They are perennial plants. Um, they come in a whole crazy variety of colors, which I really love. They're also known as the Lenten Rose, but they are not at all related to roses. <laughs> uh, the colored petals that you see on a hellebore are not actually petals. They're actually sepals that wrap around the flower parts to protect them. They make a really great cut flower. However, you might be saying, but I've tried cutting them and bringing them inside and they just wilt in the vase. The way to prevent that, uh, a couple things. One, don't cut them until they are mature. And the way you can tell that is when the petals change from their initial color uh, to their final color, so they age. Secondly, the seed pod will be attached. Um, it will have produced the seed pod. That's when you can cut. So make your cut, not with snips, because uh, that will crush the stem, but with a knife, a very sharp knife, and then put a slit in the bottom of the stem um, up and down. So if this is the stem, you're going to cut a slit just like that. That will help the stem soak up more water. If you do that, everything will be great. You won't have any wilting. The other thing you can do is uh, cut them when they just start to color up. Um, and to prevent wilting, you can dip the stem for five seconds into nearly boiling water. This doesn't always work, but it's something you can give a try. So the flower on the plant can last for three months. That's what I love about these. And they go through a whole range of color changes. I just think they're beautiful. Um, they appear for me in January, sometimes December. Um, so they kind of show up around the same time as the snowdrops. And like I said, they come in a, come in a wonderful a variety of colors. I love the black ones. I don't have any because these are a shade loving plant and all the places that I would be placing them would be kind of too dark for the black variety. Um, so you wouldn't really see them. So I have a lot of the white and light pink. Um, they love, love, love shade and they're great in dry shade. They're very drought tolerant once they're established and they will slowly spread through your garden, which is also wonderful. They're not a thug. You don't have to worry about them taking over like mint or anything. They are poisonous and so deer and other wildlife will completely leave them alone, which is another benefit. So where I have all my narcissists planted, I also have a whole bunch of hellebores and the deer don't bother them at all. So pruning them, make sure you prune back the spent foliage in like November because you want to get it ahead of the growing season um, and you don't want to sacrifice any of the blooms. Um, they prefer a more alkaline soil, which is what I have, which is also kind of uncommon in the plant world. However, they can, they can tolerate neutral soils and even slightly acidic soils, but they actually like alkaline soils, um, which is another bonus. In fact, if I could have my whole front garden <laughs> as hellebores, I would do it. They are hardy in zones four to 10, huge, huge range. So most of us can grow these guys. So there you have it, my top five favorite spring flowers to grow. I will be following this video up with a top five favorite vegetables to grow. Um, and if you're thinking about it, you can get seed and start some of those if you want. Um, same thing with these flowers. You can start um, snapdragons from seed, ranunculus are from corms, um, hellebores are actual plants that you'll need to purchase. Narcissus and um, snowdrops are from bulbs. So that's how you'll get a hold of those. It's kind of, hi sweetie. I just got her a new bed and I think she's gonna test it out for the first time. Usually when I get her a new bed, I have to put it alongside her old one for maybe two weeks before she'll even attempt to get into it. She's getting into it, yay. <laughs> so cute. And now she's making biscuits. Something I got in the mail today and I do not need more seeds. I say this as I just placed a $50 order through Florette today because they had additional seeds they put up, but I just got my Johnny's catalog. Yes, I'm gonna look through it. No, I don't need more seeds. Am I gonna buy some? Probably. <laughs> I can't help myself, especially with like, you know, all the, this is, this is like um, when I first got started knitting, um, I couldn't get enough of knitting catalogs, knitting, uh, you know, like 
um, buying, buying nice needles and buying beautiful yarn and getting patterns, etc. Um, I just couldn't get enough. The seed thing has been this way for decades. <laughs> it's only gotten worse. I'm even more, more of a seed hoarder than I used to be. But that's what happens when you have something that's a hobby that you are passionate about, right? There are worse things. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you learned something in this top five favorite flowers of spring. And if you have any questions about this, let me know in the comments. I'm hoping to get out to the farm tomorrow. Might be our one, maybe two days before the next storm comes in. So I'd love to get out there and do some weeding and actually just get some physical activity going. That would be great. So I hope you have a wonderful time in your garden. Thanks for hanging out with me today and I will see you in the next one. Bye.